Stay hungry, stay foolish. So now on the Innovation Show, it's a great honor to welcome Brian Merchant, author of The One Device. We're going to talk about that today, but also Brian is editor with Vice Media and multimedia journalist with Vice Media. Brian, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you, man, on the show. The book is fantastic. It, it debunks a lot of the fantasy, <laughs> the front stage <laughs> view we have of Apple, the iPhone in particular. But before we get into that, before we get into the book and, and the different elements it talks about of both innovation, but also the innovation around this product, it'd be great to hear a bit about you, man, and what you do. Yeah, sure. Um, so I have been sort of working in the space for about, 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 about 10 years now. Um, I was kind of originally trained as a uh, sort of hard science journalist looking at stuff like uh, climate change and energy and um, sort of environmental crises. So I spent a number of years uh, covering things like oil spills and uh, you know, NASA science papers and traveling around doing that kind of stuff. Um, and then I made my way to, to Vice, where I uh, became an editor at their um, their science and technology sort of outlet called called Motherboard, uh, which I then spent a number of years at too. So uh, I have done everything from you know sort of looking at the Syrian electronic army in uh, in that in that conflict to sort of um, you know I, I investigated Soylent I still sort of try to keep a pulse on uh, the depressing state of affairs and the the, the environmental uh, world but um, for this book I, I channeled all of the above of that that sort of approach kind of uh, you know diving deep and kind of surveying. Um, from a wide angle lens, uh, w what's going on? I, I took that approach to the iPhone for this book, so um, I, I, I'd say it is. It, it, it was an interesting sort of uh, <laughs> experiment, and one that I'm I'm glad to hear uh, you, you think uh, worked out to some extent. Actually, that makes total sense. Now, your background is almost like a canvas that you you work to and now you've applied it to a different part of of the world or a different product and in this case the iphone and that comes across so much that that genuine care about the humans behind this because there's very much a human story behind this yeah. while, while it does debunk a lot of the myths and we'll go into that about the iphone and you know steve jobs being the genius with a thousand helpers but it, it actually talks about the humans behind it at many different levels and It'd be great to get to get into that because we were talking before we came on air and kind of from my reading of the book there's kind of three different levels that you you did and it's kind of front stage backstage that we have in every company right. but, but there's two right. backstages here there's the backstage in apple the guys on the ground in apple who did the work who actually came up with this these guys who were just br brilliant people who never you know yeah. get credit or not yeah. in the history books and then there's the miners, and you talk about child miners um, digging up like different tungsten and you know different yeah. minerals that are actually present in the phone that we're totally oblivious to. So maybe it'd be great to start at that level, the 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 miner level, and you know the people behind the the components for this phone. Yeah, that, that's a really good way to put it. I like that. I like how there's front stage, backstage, and then a backstage to the backstage. That I, I hadn't heard it. Uh, contextualize that way before, and I really like that because um, it because it's accurate. Accurate, and, and, you know what I was trying to do was really sort of, um, you know, r r write write a biography of the device itself, um, and sort of get to the heart of what it is. And sure, it has a product history um, and uh, and a number of people that you know that that innovated its technologies and its design um, into a product that, that we, of course, now uh, know and love. It also has, you know, a history as an, as an object, as something that has to be, uh, you know, molded from raw materials, you know, into myriad component parts and then assembled with manual labor 
and, and put together. And that's like increasingly easy to forget. That's I mean, even though it, it seems when you just say that sentence, it seems rather obvious that, yeah, of course, it's a physical object, of course. But, you know, the sort of the, you know, the marketing materials and the sheer sort of power of its mythology is kind of eroding that sort of curiosity as to, like, what is behind the screen, actually? What is, you know, actually going on uh, so that we can get all of these component parts together and to function in such a seamless and incredible way? So the first step that I decided to take was to physically remove the screen with the help of some great repair teardown experts over at iFixit. Uh, really just brilliant, brilliant folks who are both a company that they sell these tear teardown guides. They'll teach you how to fix your phone, how to replace your battery yourself, how to get the most uh, life out of it. You know, they really believe in this stuff. They believe that that devices should be transparent. We should understand how they work. The world would be a better place if we really sort of began to understand that supply chain and how the parts work together. So that, in a sense, which I kind of talk about in the introduction of the book, tearing the screen off, sort of recognizing viscerally that, okay, you know, we got to start with a, with a, you know, with the screen, with a touch screen and the sensors that enable this sort of esoteric sounding technology called multi-touch that is sort of provides the vocabulary for how we now talk to machines that that is just you know one chapter right there or the battery this lithium ion battery that you know it seems boring it's a battery it just gives us a charge but you know that has a story and even if you peel back even further then you're getting to the point where you know like all this stuff has to come at the very very most fundamental level from raw materials so i just Decided to go, you know, all out, and I actually had an iPhone pulverized um, in a metallurgy lab to really get to the essence of what physically is inside this thing. And so you can say, you know, oh, it's mostly aluminum and carbon and oxygen and iron, and then with a little bit less silicon and cobalt and all this stuff. But then you can really sort of see just splayed out before you just how much stuff goes into this and all that stuff has to be mined it's mined in you know as you alluded to sometimes very desperate difficult conditions by real people some of which are using what very well may be the opposite of an iphone like the most primitive tools that you can imagine sometimes they're bare hands to pull things like tin out of a out of a mine in the Banka Islands in Indonesia, or a pickaxe in in Bolivia, like the mine that I visited there. And yeah, sometimes you have children who work in these very very unregulated, very messy supply chains. So I I, I really just wanted to to start there with sort of this reminder that this is a physical object that has an immense amount of invisible labor baked into it. That before you know, the innovation can actually yield a tangible product, those ideas and things have to be converted from raw materials uh, into, into the product itself. Yeah. You really show care, like, and, and this is why I thought it was interesting, your, your background and your investigative background and your curiosity, because it does come across to me in the book, and it, it, it can be often, I, I would wager missed in the book that you you talk about Foxconn, for example, you know where the phone is manufactured and put together, and you talk about the suicide nets and and th this this stuff is really important. I think that goes often goes and uh, missed because we see it as this you know designed in California is on the box and right. we feel that that's where it comes from. It comes out of this machine that's just this innovation machine beautifully crafted right. building but right. what, what, when you see what you've uncovered and you've gone there and you've uncovered where it really comes from and you know i don't want to sensationalize that but i just think it's important <laughs> for people to know you know that that there's there's sacrifice that goes behind the backstage behind the backstage yeah yeah absolutely uh and and i'm glad you i'm glad you did um it's it is it is it is a really you know important part part of the puzzle and you know if you're talking about the history of a device you know i i think that history would be incomplete without without going into that element yeah you talk about foxconn and the, the conditions there as well for, yeah. for, for a lot of people is is horrific yeah it, it is 
it's a sort of a psychological horror more than kind of the horrors of maybe sort of the concept of a factory of old where you've got, you know, crazy heavy machinery and people getting risking getting crushed over that. That's not the same kind of thing. This is really, you know, a uh, vast, vast, buildings um and uh, and complexes and people just hundreds and hundreds of people standing in these really sort of insanely uh or uh de- you know detailed and very tightly wound um assembly lines and doing the same re- repetitive task it's like you know you mentioned ford earlier it's like Fordism, you know, to the hundredth power. It's just somebody is doing like literally just, you know, maybe they're polishing a screen and then next, maybe they're just soldering in one tiny component and then next, and they do this literally hundreds of times a day. Um, and there's a lot of pressure. And if they, cause if they screw up the culture of, of work there is such that they are apt to be publicly humiliated and punished. If they bring dishonor to the assembly line, the, the manager can stand them up and berate them and, you know, these are people who are often sort of isolated to begin with. They come from rural parts of the country, um, and these factories are um, the most famous one. The one that I managed to to slip inside was 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 Longhua, uh, the Foxconn sort of most famous flagship factory, which at its height had nearly half a million people who were living, working, eating, breathing, sleeping there. Um, so it's really sort of this psychological environment that the people that we interviewed um my translator and i really kind of kept speaking about this ghost of death or this normalizing of death how normal it was that you just kind of expect people to die um around you because things are so grim um that that it, it it just it really it really is it's something that's it, that's kind of difficult or at least it was difficult for me to sort of comprehend until I saw it with my own eyes and 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 saw sort of what like a place like this does to you that's so vast very I mean it's kind of cliche to call it soulless but but it is it's a place that's designed without a single iota of interest in complementing you know, the human experience, there's nothing, there's no parks, there's no public places you can go. There's a Seven Eleven inside this factory and you can go buy stuff, but you can't really have a multidimensional life there really. So it is uh, a different kind of, of, of burden. You know, they're not really risking uh, a, a cave in like some of the miners in the, in the, in, in, in Bolivia that I met, but they are, um, you know, risking this really sort of psychological degradation. It's another major cost, a major input of, of the device that I just think that is worth thinking about as we, you know, yeah, swipe and, and yeah. change to zoom. And yeah, because because we, we do take and and we we take that for granted as well, and we take that for granted in many things, our clothing, everything. Like there's a, there's a different yeah, absolutely. World. You know, and I felt yeah, and I just. I, I I just have to interject and make it really clear because like sometimes people say like oh it's not Apple that you know Apple it it, it isn't just Apple no but Apple is Apple is just <clears throat> you know the the lens through which I'm you know viewing this this particular supply chain so yeah it's absolutely true this is the model for how things get made and there are much worse factories than this even so yeah, yeah it's it's not it's not. Um, to say that you know Apple is particularly egregious, but it's it's the it's the fact that like this is the reality on the ground, and this is certainly how you know your your iPhone gets made. Yeah, because because I I do I agree with you there, and 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 by the way, like you know, our chat here today is not about that at all. It's not about this isn't an Apple which one, and the book isn't either. And I think that's really no. important for people to know because I know. I've read some commentary from just people commenting like they're just kind of going, "Oh, you're just going after Apple," and you're not at all. Like you're, no. you're, you're a fan of Apple, <laughs> if anything, and, and yeah. you just looked at yeah. it through a different lens. Yeah, yeah, I just try to understand it holistically, um, and it's, it's, it's true. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'd say I'm pretty, ne- I'm neutral on, you know, a- Apple as much as I as much as I can be. I do. I th- think that there are things that they could do better especially because they have this sort of unique position as arguably the most powerful private uh, you know the most 
powerful company in the world? Like, I, yeah, I think they could wield their their influence um, and, and make some beneficial changes. But you know, that's not that's not really the point of the book. Is not to sort of you know build rack up sort of a, a bunch of criticisms of Apple. It's to try to understand how this process works and you know just to sort of give you a soup to nuts understanding of like what it really does take and what it took historically to get the device into your hands yeah because because actually the in a way i know you you physically took the phone apart and looked at all the components but in a way it's a metaphor for society around producing a product like this but also the next stage is is the backstage within apple so the people who you know you you dissected this as well who who were the guys on the ground and the girls on the ground who actually came up with the different pieces that we take for granted because you talk about stuff like even yeah. shrinking down safari the maps everything needed to be yeah. multi touch all all these things that we are just you look at a kid now and the kid is touching the the TV trying to do the same gestures but yeah. they, but they yeah. were they were actually <laughs> That innovation and the the thinking came from people on the ground within Apple and often behind yeah. Jobs' back as well, which I found that fascinating. That yeah. you know he was he was oblivious to some of this work. Absolutely, and I, I, it's interesting to see how some of that 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 did come about. And that was one of the most surprising things to me too. Is I had heard bits and pieces of the story of how sort of the iPhone sort of was championed internally as this product and you know you maybe heard a little bit about sort of the different approaches that they might have taken um uh given between like sort of an ipod phone and a touch thing but i had never ever seen um or heard anyone talk about the the sort of the depth of this of the iphone's prehistory even at apple which is that there was this series of sort of freewheeling investigations into what um, this very small group of it, it was just it was an industrial designer or two it was uh, a, a handful of of software user interface designers and then a few sort of um, jack of all trades sort of input engineer guys hardware hacking kind of uh, really brilliant folks um, and they were just basically like they had this open ended question where they were just kind of saying, well, wouldn't it be interesting if we could just like meet regularly and just talk about where we think uh, computers are just going to go next and how we, especially how we want to interact with them. Um, and I think it's so telling that uh, the seed of the iPhone was planted in this experiment focused on uh, how we as humans want to interact with, with, with machines, with computers. It's the interaction um, more than everything, uh, more than anything. And they, and they really sort of focused in on one technology, you know, after they looked at all these sort of different sort of freewheeling, you know, sci-fi esque sometimes, sometimes even boring, you know, that we're talking like range finding sensors, m minority report type sort of gesture recognition or, um, down to like, just like force feedback mice and stuff. But they really kind of, bombed on to this uh this idea uh, that was at the time put forward in what was basically a medical device for people who had um repetitive strain injuries or hand injuries disabilities that prevented them from using a regular keyboard made by this uh this guy named Wayne Westerman and his colleague uh who was his thesis advisor actually John Elias and those are two of the unsung heroes of the iPhone for sure because what they had done is they had made this black mat that was basically a pad that could recognize gestures. You could swipe and um, you could type on it, and it was much more low impact. So Wayne had himself uh, a hand disability, and he couldn't type for long periods of time. So he invented this, this pad um, that he went on to market after he got his PhD um, called, called Fingerworks. And one of those pads just made its way into Apple. And these guys who had embarked on this uh, freewheeling sort of set of, exp uh, of explorations, which, as you mentioned, they were doing this unbeknownst to Jobs at all, not because, you know, they were going to, you know, 
like hatch this thing just for themselves, but because they didn't, they were worried that if Jobs saw it, he would just go like, "This, this is this looks like a waste of time. This is a mess. So what are you guys doing in here? Just kind of talking and you're not being productive or whatever." So they were just worried that kind of he would interrupt the process. Uh, so they glommed on to multi-touch and they really hacked up this kind of insane rig where uh, they basically, it was like the size of a room. They, they wheeled this table into this abandoned user testing lab uh, that was made at the turn of, uh, of, of the decade in like the 90s, early 90s. So there's like VHS <laughs> tape players on the wall. There's a <clears throat> surveillance cameras dangling down. It's this weird space. And they're filling the room up with this prototype rig. It's like a table and then they've got the fingerworks pad on the middle of it with a white piece of paper put over the, the fingerworks pad. And then they wheeled in a projector and they hung this, this projector lens from the ceiling and piped in a Mac OS uh, software, they, they, what the, just the Mac that they were running at the time, so that they could start to simulate what it would be like to, to touch a screen. Because a fingerworks pad, you could only touch a pad. This was uh, bringing that touch technology to a screen, which is one of the great in a, innovations of the of the iPhone. So these guys really, um, it was Duncan Kerr, the industrial designer, uh, Boss Wording, Imran Chowdhury, uh, Greg Christie from the user interface group, and then um, this MIT uh, whiz kid named Josh Strickon and a, and a hardware engineer named Brian Huppy. These were the guys who were really sort of in the room molding what sort of the basic interaction paradigm that would go on to sort of inspire everything else about the iPhone. These are the guys that sort of hatched that and they did it, you know, they did do it without jobs and jobs. And it, in fact, it irks some of them that kind of one of the more famous on the record statements that jobs made about it was in this interview with Walt Mossberg, where he's like, you know, like, Oh, I had this idea where I could take a, a screen and I could touch it and read email on it. And I, you know, gave it to some of my engineers and said, can you make this? And they were just kind of like flabbergasted. They were like, what? This never, that never happened. Yeah. We made it, you know, we, we built this thing and then, you know, we showed it to you and John, well, Johnny, I've showed it to him and he was even kind of lukewarm on it. And then as time passed, he decided that he had in fact invented it himself. Yeah, so it's one of the funny things about, I suppose, any innovation in any company, you have people like that, those guys you mentioned, and oftentimes they go overlooked, but the only way they can, they can float the idea to the top of the building is, is ways like this, isn't it? It's like, so they got, they first had to convince Johnny Ive to get him on board, probably Forstel and, and Fidel as well. And get those yeah. guys on board so that they can communicate it up to jobs in a way that, you know, makes him look good. But, but more importantly, that makes the company look good. Because I do, I do always think, like, you, those pockets of innovation within any company, you need, you need a chief storyteller. So jobs is that. In, like, he's one of the geniuses of that, telling a great right. story to stockholders, to the public, to any stakeholder. Yeah. That, yeah. that actually sells the product. And, that, you know, those guys probably wouldn't have been able to get it off the, the ground otherwise. And, and this is the great, it can be a tragedy, but when you see it in concert where you see that the head of orchestra, like Jobs, calling the notes, the right notes yeah. at the right time, everywhere, publicly, in the press, etc., even to Mossberg, yeah. like you mentioned, that's how it happens. But, but yeah, there's guys that don't get mentioned. And, and I suppose yeah. it's, it's kind of like a, it's like a team in any sport as well. Like there's some guys who do the crappy jobs, uh, you know, blockers. <laughs> right, right. Nobody's going, going, oh, that was a great block. They're going, great touchdown. Or, or else they're going, what a great yeah. coach. What a great, you know, the coach is the guy who talks to the press or the captain or the quarterback. And it, right. it, it's kind of similar, isn't it, in a way where it's just where you are in the, in the, in the pecking order. Yeah, it is. There are some things about Apple and Steve Jobs led Apple especially that are a little bit more radical where he did kind of implement this sort of this gag order on anybody else talking to to the press. And that wasn't really the case before he returned to the company in the in the later 90s. Um so there was this sense where there was a vacuum where you know, it was he was a brilliant storyteller. He was a brilliant 
uh, icon and figurehead for Apple and a brilliant marketer. Um, and sort of as a result, and you know, there's no arguing that his strategy was 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 not a, a was anything but ultra effective. But yeah, the byproduct of that is that these guys, these user interface designers, for instance, were some of the you know most brilliant. Uh, software designers, probably the last 20, 30 years, um, in my estimation, the, the, the sort of level of the influential product that they made. And yet they, you know, even they weren't, weren't recognized until I was able to interview them for this, for this book, um, 10 years after the thing was made, which is really kind of incredible. And jobs was, was also really, he's a really interesting, uh, sort of, character uh in the way that he creeps up in in, in the oral history uh and the the interviews that i did because he made some genius calls and yeah you're you're absolutely right he um especially sort of put into relief uh, with tim cook led apple today he was able to just sort of make a call get everybody to believe in it rally the troops marshal the company's resources you know just bar none like this was once the iphone was sort of once he signed off on it it was just all systems go and you just you really don't see that kind of thing happening at apple or rarely you rarely see it happen happen at a large company anywhere um these days some where you're able to pull your lead people off of other projects like halt product lines really sort of just really believe in one particular product sort of uh really i mean they Forstall calls it a make or break product, and 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 it really kind of was, um, but but he was you know goaded into making some of those decisions, and he as a good executive, he listened to his his e staff um, uh, every step of the way, but you know he rarely he rarely sort of was the, like the sort of the charging voice that we imagine, like sort of the lead, you know, like. I, you know, I think that there's a famous New York Times story um, that was like, you know, and Steve Jobs said there will be let there be an iPhone or something like that. And, it's, <laughs> and it, it's really all these people around him. It's a more collaborative process where he got, got to say, like, OK, this looks this does look cool. You've proven it to me. I will, you know, keep this product in, in, in development. OK, but now it has to square off against this product. Now, both of you try to make it as good as, as possible, you know, yeah. Um, and he was able to sort of make the right calls when it counted. Um, and and maybe when I started out, I was a little even more skeptical of Jobs' role. But I think, you know, now everything that I've learned, like he just you, – you really have to give him a lot of credit for – for making the calls at the points that he did and, you know, rallying, rallying support in such an effective way. Yeah, because, you know, like I thought about those guys you mentioned uh, – and you know, hacking together like uh, a physic a room almost as a multi touch a multi touch yeah. room. And I kinda of thought then about, you know, in my head I have the the same vision of Jobs and Wozniak in their garage when they started off doing this. You know, and I'm kinda of going, yeah. Well yeah. yeah. What why why wouldn't you bless this when you know where your own innovation came from in the first place? And then yeah. then I kinda of start thinking about, well, it's kind of like Cook now in that, you know, when, when you're making profits, it's very difficult to, to pull people off those profits and kind of go, okay, well, you work on the next one. You work on the next yeah. uh, jump of, of where we're, the company's going. Um, yeah. You know, that, that dawned on me. But, but what more importantly dawned on me was who, who blessed these guys? Like, I mean, how did, they, how did they hide this in a way? Like, who was... Somebody had to be kind of going, okay, you guys are going to turn a blind eye. You guys go off to Sector 7G and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Well, so Apple was a little bit different at the time. Um, you know, it was the early 2000s. There were sort of these pockets and people had room to sort of do that kind of thing where they ju they did. It, it really did just sort of percolate that way where it was just like, well, there was a couple of, of guys who were enthusiastic about trying to do something else. This in particular, this input engineer who had kind of gotten bored of just sort of iterating laptops. And he had come to Apple because he had been inspired by uh, reading insanely great and hearing the story of the first Macintosh. So he wanted to like really like make something crazy and, you know, whatever it took. 
Um, so he kind of, you know, was one of these sort of driving forces and just like saying, let's, let's set aside some of the time for, for having this sort of, this sort of conversation. And he found, you know, it really is about sort of, you know, it's, it's very political, right? Like even at the most basic level, you find people who are like-minded and, and he found this guy, Duncan Kerr, who he had done some favors for, um, helping to, to build, I believe it is like a, a, one of the a a light in one of those early clamshell uh mac notebooks and they had kind of found an affinity for for you know design and engineering together so they sort of uh you know were friendly and duncan knew boss and imran and so they just you know the, the the idea that you know maybe we should have something a little more aspirational and work on something a little bit crazier than we're doing right now sort of appealed to this group. And then, you know, they talked to, they did, they brought it to Johnny Ive who was sort of fresh off his team's accolades in um, designing, you know, the, the sort of the rejuvenated uh, Bondi blue Mac line and all had, they had made their product line look cool again. So he had a lot of sort of, influence at the company at the time and he you know could say like yeah of course guys you know do set aside a a couple hours every week or whatever and they so they started meeting when it was still at the very basic conversation level in the industrial design studio so that's when the very initial most sort of theoretical kind of just broadest strokes were laid out um and yeah, they and Greg Christie, who would uh, become the head of the human interface group, also had a had a little bit of, you know, managerial stature. Uh, he was one of the only guys who had the physical key to this abandoned user testing lab. So they knew that no one would bother them because he, you know, he so he let Boss and Imran um, and, and the hardware and software guys in there to sort of experiment. So it really was this kind of very under the radar kind of, but more sort of casual at first, you know, I think it got a little more, they got excited about it and they wanted to keep it secret because they thought that they were onto something. There's a scene in the book where I talk about how they're like regarding it, like this sort of like really inspiring work of art where they're, you know, just kind of like spending hours and they can't tear themselves away from the screen. And so the project really did sort of begin very organically, like a conversation between some of the people who had, worked together in the past successfully and it had just kind of very sort of naturally formed this team that knew that they could work well together knew that they could uh that they that they had some bites on on innovation that they could kind of pursue so it, it, it's a i think it's a really interesting case study and then you know the next step once once you know Jobs had signed off on that approach and he liked it, the next step was to bring in the software engineer guys to, you know, to marry the computing power to the user interface, and that was a whole another uh, undertaking in and of itself. And you know, Richard Williamson, Henri Lamoureux, Nathan Ganatra, these guys who are really like all-star engineers. Again, they convened in the human interface uh, groups offices, they came and joined them and they formed this really symbiotic sort of, everybody describes it as being unusually close, unusually collaborative where you had engineers sitting right next to designers or a room over and, you know, the UI guy could come over and say like, Hey, look at this. Can we do this? And on, you know, on, if we're going to have it going 60 frames a, a second, they could say, ah, no, but try this. And they could, really bounce ideas back back and forth really quickly um, and fluidly. So that basically became the purple dorm, uh, which is this the, the whole iPhone software project was called the, the Purple Project. And that became kind of the sealed off top secret. Um, you know, the secrecy gets all the play and that's kind of interesting and important too. But the fact is, is that these guys were basically locked in this room together. Their ideas were just basically forced to combine and grow together. One of the guys there who's now much more senior told me that, that this is the most influence he's ever exerted on a single product 
uh, ever he has ever before and probably ever will since, even though he's higher up now, just the fact that it was sort of like this all hands on deck project. It really does validate the idea of, you know, an incubator or an innovation lab within a company. Now, the, the problem often with an innovation lab is it's usually just ticking a box and going, yeah, we have an innovation lab. But and I think going back to what we talked about earlier, that was Jobs genius, real genius in this and that he made it happen. And then yeah. not only did he make it happen, he created a great story, even the secrecy, like you say, he created yeah. this great, you know, just outwardly front stage vision of what this is. And, yeah. and you know, but but also, you know, you, you mentioned in the book, and I thought it was, was I just pictured myself sitting at my, my desk one day and, you know, somebody tipping me in the shoulder that I may not have seen him before and going, oh, I heard you're good at your job. We want you to come and work in the, pur- in the Purple Project with us. And I'm going to go, okay, well, I just need to think about that. And, and maybe I need to talk to my spirit. And you're going to go, no, no, I need you to come now. <laughs> and you, right. you, talk, you talk about that and you kind of put yourself in that seat and you kind of go, yeah, what would I do? Because I don't know what I'm going to, but obviously when I do it, I'm part of the, probably one of the most important projects ever. Right. And, you know, and the, that's, yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. That's an interesting way of thinking about it because I'd say it was split between people who recognized it as being important already and people who are just kind of like, oh, well, well, like, I mean, that's the thing. In hindsight, it takes on these mythic proportions. But at the time, you know, there's this that famous sort of recruitment effort that went on inside of Apple where, you know, the engineers were sort of approached by management, most famously by Scott Forstall, but also by his deputies. And they would, you know, close the door to an engineer's office and say, like, listen, we can't tell you anything about this project. It's uh, going to be the hardest work you've ever done in your life. It's going to be so insane. Uh, you're never going to you know, be able to take a holiday or a weekend or whatever. Um, and, you know, a lot of people like said no. You know, a lot of people were like, no, thanks. Like, I'm, I, I like my team, you know, working on mail or whatever. Um, a lot of people, you know, went and they went to work on the iPhone. But even some of the guys, some of the more sort of higher level folks were like, kind of like, oh, you know, a phone, you know, like, cool, I guess. Like, yeah, let's do it. But it didn't have it wasn't clear that this was going to be the game changing product of all time, of course, at the time, because how could it? It was still so theoretical, so, um, you know, so abstract in a sense. So it is interesting to, to wonder, like, at that, was he sort of injecting sort of an instant mythology into the story by by layering on secrecy? I mean, a lot of the guys say that it's more just a purely sort of a, and, uh, you know, a, a byproduct of his natural paranoia. Uh, that's what Fidel told me anyways, was just like, he's just a naturally paranoid guy. Like, he really believed that they had gold in this software uh, interface that the iPhone was going to be based on. And he just did not want anyone to see it. He didn't want anybody, if they left the company, to to see it. But in fact, did the secrecy double as sort of this, like, motivating sort of instant, like, you're part of the squad? Uh, maybe. Maybe. It yeah. could have. Um, yeah. It's really interesting to think about in hindsight. Um, and I think your point is a good one. And that's that Jobs, whether he, whether knowingly or not, he wielded his own mythology, his own sort of status as this leader, this guru in the industry so effectively. Um, you know, that could, that had real detriments if you were on the other side of his uh capriciousness you could get yelled at and maybe your life could be miserable for a while but he really did sort of totally sort of you know was capable of orchestrating these sea changes and sort of and as as you put it like really sort of drilling down the stories of these uh, of this product yeah. um and that's something that like you know tim cook as you said like tim cook maybe is more reluctant on the profit profit level to say like oh well i don't you know why mess too much with a good thing we've got these dependable you know revenue streams and whatnot but on a whole nother level maybe he's simply just incapable of marshalling that level of sort of institutional support for a project uh, even if he was as passionate about it he doesn't have the same sort of legacy as jobs or the same sort of you know people aren't as willing to sort of go to the mat he would you know he's 
got to worry about stuff like the board and about, you know, ex- executive politics and, you know, he things that jobs didn't really have to worry about as much. Yeah, because so. I suppose jobs as well owning the company, you know, that it's a different, you're coming in at a different level all the time. But I also, you know, Jim, Jim Collins, Good to Great book is just one of my, my favorites. And he talks about this chapter where he talks about the genius with a thousand helpers and how that is not helpful for a company. And I know you've talked about this with, with the Edison and the Henry Ford type yeah. examples where it's like, there's this vision of one guy, you know, mad scientist coming up with all right. these ideas when it's the total opposite is true. And there's a, there's a great quote, uh, another brilliant person, Buckminster Fuller, and he, he, he says, uh, nothing in a caterpillar will ever tell you it's going to be a butterfly. So in a, in a way, like you're, you, you're it's going to be messy. It's going to be ugly. Like I can picture those guys in this dirty backstage, you know, bunker. You know, yeah. building this thing and then what it becomes this beautifully crafted product at the end we see but yeah. it, it's just about you know the, the vision of Forstall or, or whoever it was who started going or Johnny Ive to start going you know what these guys are onto something and then percolating that up and yeah. packaging it up right for the right people and then that's when that's what innovation is like that and, that, and you know I think that's a real powerful lesson that, that I would like Everyone, you know, I, I told you we're working Catawave and we work with companies to get to help them make these jumps, you know, away from, you know, even even at the moment where your Apple is, it's at the top of its its growth curve. So it's very yeah. hard for it to jump to another one because it's kind of going, yeah, but we're making money here. You know, don't stop us. We're making money. And it's, right. again, reflects in what you said about, you know, some people were tapped on the shoulder to go, we want you to work on the future of the business and they go well actually i'm too busy working on the present of it you know and i'm <laughs> right. i'm comfortable doing this you know and that that's i think that's a really important lesson that you do in part really well brian and, and i know you've written a few blogs out of the book you know kind of um excerpts in a way and they i think they impart that lesson really well good yeah i i i do think that that that, that is an important part too um yeah and like you said it's it's really it is, you know, up to folks to be really aware of what's what is percolating up and what, uh, you know, what what people have taken the initiative themselves to do um, and really sort of respecting that work, too, because it does, you know, so few not with Edison, not with, you know, Ford do these ideas just kind of spring fully formed from anybody's mind there, you know, they accumulate like a little, you know, buffet line maybe of ideas and technologies that then these figures who are empowered by their, you know, executive position or by capital or by whatever to be able to pluck them and to use them and, you know, and to, to, to sort of elevate them, as you said. Yeah. And you know, you said about uh, Jobs claiming that he, you know, in his interview at Moss, uh, with Mossberg, that it's like, I have uh, this vision, blah, blah, blah. And you, you know, sometimes we actually all do that where we're actually, we've read something and then we, we digest it over time. And then we actually convince ourselves, did I come up with that idea? <laughs> you know, so yeah. there's probably a little bit of that because there's so much well, going on in his world. <laughs> Few people did that as as uh, <laughs> as aggressively as Jobs, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. But they say uh, success when when you're successful, you can write the history books yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, then and, and fortunately, Jobs Jobs has been fortunate to have a number of history books written about him, and mine is about uh, is about everyone else. Yeah, so. well, it's it's a fantastic book, <laughs> and, I, and I highly recommend it. I'll link to it uh, both on the site and in iTunes and SoundCloud, etc. Brian, it's been oh, a, great. a fabulous talking to you. Brian Merchant, author of The One Device and editor with Vice Media. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It was good fun. Thanks, man.